the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point Northern Aquaculture Demonstration Facility, in cooperation with Lac de Flambeau Indian Tribe and Wisconsin Sea Grant, presents Pond Culture, an online workshop. This is the third presentation in our Pond Culture series where we will discuss water quality. To become successful in fish production, a pond manager must understand many variables within a pond environment. One of the most important of these variables is water quality. Understanding the water quality and biological requirements of the fish species reared in your pond environment is crucial. Within this water quality topic, we will touch on water supply, water quality parameters, goals and monitoring, and vegetation control. To begin, water quality in the pond starts with the water supply. Having safe, dependable source of water quality within a required quantity or flow is imperative for success with your ponds. There are four main ways of filling your ponds with water. The first way listed here is groundwater. The second is springs or seepage. The third way, streams. And lastly, rainwater or snowmelt. We will discuss the pros and cons of each of these water supplies in the next slide. The first type of water supply listed is groundwater, which is the safest supply of water to fill a pond but usually comes with the cost of pumping. Not only is groundwater biosecure, but it is also filtered and has a constant temperature. Ponds can also be filled with springs, seepage, streams, or runoff. Although springs also have a constant temperature and may be filtered, they are not biosecure as they may be exposed to bacteria in the soil and air. Additionally, springs may contain a high number of total suspended solids or high turbidity that may negatively affect your fish as well as the balance within the pond system. On the same note, although less expensive, streams and runoff can also bring in excessive amounts of nutrients, sediment, or other materials also negatively affecting your pond environment. Water temperature of runoff and stream water is always changing which in turn fluctuates the pond temperature, causing stress and imbalance. Furthermore, stream supply may bring in undesirable species and usually requires extra permitting, which may be more costly in the long run. In summary, utilizing any water source besides groundwater may increase your biosecurity or contamination risk, introduce aquatic invasive species or fish predators, or fluctuate your water quality, which will all negatively impact fish production of a pond system. Having a good understanding of your water supply and its makeup is important before siting or filling a pond. We would recommend that you test your water source periodically for specific parameters that are important for fish culture. Make sure you have an adequate quantity of water to fill your ponds to maintain levels throughout the summer and during periods of evaporation or seepage. When oxygen depletion occurs in your pond, it is very important to have a good volume of water available in order to help save your fish. This is a list of recommended water quality parameters for aquaculture taken from a variety of sources. It is suggested to have your source water tested periodically to make sure that it is within these parameters for fish production. A copy of this table will be provided during the field training portion of this workshop. In the book, Water Quality Management for Pond Fish Culture, Claude Boyd states that the goals of water quality management are to regulate environmental conditions so that they are within a desirable range for the survival and growth of fish. In waters used for fish culture, production is often increased by using a fertilizer and or commercial fish feed. Fish are also providing metabolic waste products such as carbon dioxide, ammonia, phosphorus, and others to the pond water. Some of these waste products are potentially toxic to fish in high enough doses. Managing water quality while optimizing fish production can be tricky. Many water quality problems may occur in ponds managed for fish production but the most important seem to be related to an excessive plankton production, which leads to imbalances in dissolved oxygen budgets. Another issue is due to low dissolved oxygen, which leads to poor growth and fish mortalities. And lastly, a buildup of toxic metabolites such as ammonia, nitrite, and nitrate can also limit the growth, 
Health and Survival of Pond-Reared Fish. It is important to build a baseline for your pond water quality through regular monitoring of important pond parameters. This will allow you to recognize when there is a problem in your ponds early enough to take the steps to fix it. Become a proactive manager. In other words, have a proactive approach to stop potential problems before they get a chance to turn into a large or catastrophic issue. A reactive approach to farming comes with poor monitoring and preparation which leads to detrimental results to your fish and business. To reiterate, maintaining good water quality within a pond comes with good management practices, which includes regular pond monitoring. The first and most important parameter to monitor are both temperature and oxygen levels within your pond. We recommend daily readings in the morning for temperature and oxygen levels in each pond. The next important parameters to monitor are ammonia and pH levels within your pond. Monitoring pond turbidity and water addition to your pond as needed are also important practices. We will discuss the importance of each of these and how they are managed in the next few slides. Let's begin with maintaining healthy oxygen levels within your pond. Because oxygen is vital and most important, it should be monitored regularly or often daily if possible. Monitoring can be accomplished utilizing a handheld meter or test tube method pond side. Oxygen is naturally produced within a pond through both gas exchange at the water surface and photosynthesis. Some oxygen is produced by aquatic rooted plants, but most is typically provided by phytoplankton. Although plants produce oxygen, they also consume it throughout the night. This is why monitoring dissolved oxygen levels is crucial at or near sunrise, when levels will be the lowest. Generally, fish perform well at concentrations above 4 parts per million. We like to see 6 to 7 parts per million in our ponds at UWSP and ADF. Another rule of thumb to be aware of while managing your ponds is, as water temperature rises and biological processes increase, oxygen levels decrease. This leads us to our next slide. The most important physical variable affecting dissolved oxygen concentrations in ponds is water temperature. Water temperature throughout the summer influences the water's oxygen capacity, or the water's ability to hold oxygen. Typically, we are rearing walleyes at 65 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit in Wisconsin ponds. The amount of oxygen available at these temperatures is much lower than at colder temperatures due to the solubility level of oxygen, as shown in the table. This is a critical component of rearing fish in ponds during the summer. This graph is an example of fluctuations in water quality over the course of the summer. This data was collected at UWSP and ADF from the facility's ponds. Throughout the summer, as the water temperature increases, shown by the black line, Oxygen levels shown by the purple line in the water decrease. Ponds can also undergo stratification during the summer. This is when higher water temperatures and lack of wind form layers of various water densities in the pond. These layers, especially near the bottom, may become anaerobic, posing negative effects for the fish. These situations are why pond oxygen problems are most acute in the late summer, such as August, when your ponds have the highest biomass of fish and possibly the least wind or activity at high temperatures. In order to assist with oxygen levels in a pond, there are various ways to aerate and circulate water. Some aeration examples include paddle wheels, air pumps with diffusers, and air lifts. These may serve as continuous aerators for water circulation or on standby for emergencies when oxygen is near depletion. It is important to also realize that in ponds, oxygen is utilized directly by not only the fish, but also bacteria, plankton, and plants in the pond. Therefore, when used intensively, these aeration systems increase fish production per unit of volume or water usage. Aeration systems not only help keep oxygen levels up, but also help to circulate the water within a pond and limit stratification. As mentioned in the previous slide, when a pond begins to undergo stratification or form layers due to varying temperatures and densities, 
areas of the pond become oxygen depleted. Decomposition of waste at the bottom of the pond is essential and is oxygen dependent. During stratification, decomposition is limited due to low oxygen levels. This can be counteracted by aerating the water from the bottom to the top, which circulates the water throughout the pond. One recommendation during the hot summer months with little wind is to aerate at night to avoid overheating your pond. In the case of winter operation, aeration systems can also be beneficial to prevent ice from forming completely across the pond, therefore preventing winter kill. Because oxygen is crucial for fish survival, it should be monitored most often. We also recommend to track toxic waste metabolites such as ammonia, nitrite, nitrate, as well as pH levels periodically. Metabolite buildup is not as large a threat to fish as low oxygen in a pond, but is also a high concern. This may be contributed by source water, microbial breakdown of waste, and fish metabolism in a pond system. Generally, what drives toxic levels of waste metabolites in ponds is high pH due to high photosynthesis activity. Therefore, ponds should be monitored on a sunny day in the warm summer months, midday to late afternoon, when photosynthesis will be highest, just to make sure there is not a problem. In case of unsafe levels, adding fresh water is one management practice that may be useful in flushing out the system. Not only does pH drive metabolic processes, but also many of the other water quality parameters that we manage for in pond aquaculture. Having a good understanding of pH and how it affects these parameters is important for good water quality management. Generally, a neutral pH or around 7 is optimal, although fish production can be achieved with pH readings ranging from 6.5 to 8.0 within a pond system. Measuring pH can be accomplished several ways. Most water quality test kits will include either a litmus paper or reagent that you can add to water in a test tube and then compare to a color metric scale. A digital pH meter is another fairly easy option. Since pH is such an important indicator of water quality, we highly recommend that you invest in purchasing a good quality pH meter and then be sure to calibrate and use the meter regularly. Another important parameter to monitor is the pond's clarity or turbidity every few days. Turbidity levels are important in the pond for several reasons. Often, turbidity indicates a good bloom of plankton, which can be verified by collecting a sample with a plankton net to observe under a microscope. Verifying that you have the correct type, size, and quantity of zooplankton for the fish is crucial, especially at the fry or larval stage. We will discuss this more in the fish management module. Turbidity can also help limit rooted plants in your ponds. Additionally, we have found that turbidity assists with discouraging many fish predators such as herons and kingfishers. If they cannot see the fish, they cannot eat the fish. A secchi disc can be used in the field to come up with a quantifiable measurement of turbidity for record keeping. A secchi disc is a round disc with black and white markings to give a visible indication of turbidity that can be easily made with some simple materials. The secchi disc is placed into the water until no longer visible. This distance underwater is measured and recorded. Standard secchi disc's readings of less than 12 inches are what we try to achieve at NADF in our outdoor ponds, meaning that at 12 inches below the water line or less, the secchi disc is no longer visible. Another common practice in pond management is to periodically add water to replace losses due to seepage, evaporation, and for cooling. There are also other benefits when adding water continuously or flow through, which include minimizing ice formation in the winter, cooling the pond in the summer months, and reducing nutrient loads. Water flow through does have disadvantages, which include stricter regulations, increased permitting, and additional fertilizer to keep the pond productive. It is important to balance these pros and cons of water addition to best manage your pond. When rearing fish in ponds for the table or restaurant market, 
a fish farmer needs to be aware of the possibility of off flavor, which can be caused by blue-green algae producing geosmin. This results in an earthy or musty flavor, which is not desirable for market sales. Fish can absorb these orders directly from the pond water. If fish are designated for the food-eating market, they may need to be purged for 7 to 10 days in cleaner, algae-free water before slaughter and taken off feed. After discussing fertilization practices in the previous pond management module, we also need to consider vegetation control of a pond. If a pond becomes overgrown with weeds and filamentous algae, fish entanglement can result and fish harvesting becomes very difficult. Also, the amount of decaying plant matter poses a threat to oxygen levels and increases ammonia. It is important to balance the amount of fertilization and plant growth for fish production and management activities in the pond. Most of the common nuisance weeds begin growth on the pond's bottom. Therefore, it is difficult for these rooted plants to become established in deeper ponds because light cannot penetrate the bottom. Also, it is most effective to control plants in their early stages of development and before their reproductive stages. In order to control vegetation, first the problem plant must be identified. After this, the method of control is to be considered. There are three ways to control vegetation in a pond, by means of biological, mechanical, or chemical control, which we will discuss next. We will first discuss biological control of vegetation. This is by affecting the natural processes within a pond to control unwanted vegetation. The easiest way to do this is by limiting light penetration to the bottom of a pond. This can be done by having adequate water depth or increasing turbidity. If the pond bottom is clay lined, simply stirring up the bottom periodically may increase turbidity in the pond, therefore limiting light penetration and weed growth. Another way to increase turbidity is through fertilization management regime. If fertilizer is applied during the summer months, microscopic plants are produced, which increase the turbidity of the water, thus shading out the bottom, limiting weed growth. Not only will this method control weed growth, but it also increases fish production. Fertilization of ponds for weed growth is generally effective in properly constructed ponds. Although, if the secchi disc is greater than 18 inches, meaning the pond is relatively clear at 18 inches deep, this method may not be effective. The microscopic plants cannot shade the sun's penetration enough to be effective when the pond has very low turbidity. Other ways of biological control may be to drain if possible or lower the water level in late fall to kill off weeds that grow partially submerged and have extensive root systems. Another method of vegetation control is mechanical. This is physically removing, cutting, or uprooting the vegetation from the pond. Although special machinery is available for mechanical control, these are expensive and generally impractical unless under special circumstance. In smaller ponds, hand tools can be used, but this requires greater labor. Regardless of means, mechanical control is most effective when plants are young and not fully established. The last method of vegetation control is with the use of chemicals. Because of the development of various herbicides, chemically controlling weeds has become an effective method in some instances. Herbicides, when used properly, can be effective, inexpensive, and show rapid response. They may also be less labor-intensive than the previous methods discussed. Although herbicides may sound like the answer, application may not be that simple. Unfortunately, plant and fish sensitivity to herbicides may be similar. Understanding how herbicides will affect the fish as well as humans, livestock, and other organisms in the pond is crucial before use. Due to this, there are strict regulations dictating which herbicides may be used for pond culture. There is also risk of oxygen depletion when using herbicides. If too many plants die at once, there will be excessive decay depleting the pond of oxygen. Another point is the rate of herbicide dilution. Often the herbicide must reach a certain concentration within the water to become effective. The rate of water exchange by seepage or outflow must be considered 
as well as other substances within the pond that may neutralize the chemical. Herbicides may be applied directly to surface plants or in the water to affect submerged plants. Some treatments must be dispersed very uniformly while others not as important. Generally, the more rapid the chemical loses its toxicity, the more uniformly it must be distributed. Also, if the fish are at all affected by its toxicity, the more uniformly it must be distributed. This concludes the third module of the Pond Culture Workshop. We would like to acknowledge the resources and professionals that have provided information utilized for this module. We hope this helps you become a more effective pond manager. This module is meant to be an introduction to the water quality portion of pond culture management and is to be a prerequisite to further training. Thank you for your attention. Please continue on to the fourth and final PowerPoint lecture on fish management.